Welcome back to Tech Society, the podcast delivering candid conversations with smart people, tech and business leaders, academics and more about their big ideas and how they're changing our world. And now your hosts, Alex Dunmo and John Newey. Hey techies, welcome to another episode of Tech Society. Today we're speaking with Ewan McIntosh, founder of NoTosh, the no-nonsense company that makes accessible the creative process required to innovate, to find meaningful problems and solve them. NoTosh helps people think differently and change the way they choose to work as individuals, as part of a team and as part of an organization. NoTosh has a rich history of helping schools in Western Australia, and today marks 11 years to the day that NoTosh was founded. In today's episode, Ewan shares with us his take on what it takes to improve education for everybody. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about Notosh? Is that how you say it, Notosh? That is how you say it, although it's pronounced in so many different ways by different people. So yeah, Notosh, I started 11 years ago. So 11 years ago, I was at home at my kitchen table and I'd been working for Channel 4 Television for a couple of years as a digital commissioner. So commissioning startups, actually doing a lot of the kind of thing that I know you guys do in your day job, which is helping people with really interesting ideas, actually turn them into reality. I was lucky in that the the people had great ideas and they also had the capability to make them happen. But what they didn't have was a, a route to the market or, or a brand. And Channel 4 yeah. Delhi in the UK, at least, is a, a significant brand and, and has great pooling power amongst uh, kind of tech savvy audiences. And we were doing public service digital stuff, but with private, the, private financing, private startup mentality. So really entrepreneurial. And I was wondering how every tech company, every designer that I was working with, they could all talk to each other. On a Friday night, they could, they could go, different companies could go to the bar and talk to each other about their process, about how they were working, even though they came from different places. And in school and education, you can't do that. And originally, I'm a teacher. I'm a, a French and German teacher in high school. And education conferences, professional learning events, we spend so much time talking about what we're trying to talk about rather than talking about what we're talking about. We spend so long defining and fighting, you know, nitpicking on definitions of things. And it is important, but I sort of thought, surely we should have worked that stuff out ages ago. Is and that I wondered the if we could bring of academics. Yeah, a little bit, a little yeah. bit of that, a little bit of internet, intellectual snobbery as well, potentially. And also pride. I think people are really proud of their education systems. Nowhere, you know, nowhere tops Australia for the number of different system approaches within one country that compete against each other in some ways. And I wondered if there was a way to bring that design thinking, uh, that common language into schools, into, into the education system. And so that was that was why No Tosh came about. It's Scots for no nonsense or no crap. And so the goal was to cut through that that veneer of respectability and get down into what really mattered, which is the experience of kids, parents, staff at schools, uh, leadership, making the making the whole story much clearer for people. So you're you're doing this all over the world, right? Spreading this all over the world. Yeah. Where have you found to be the easiest? Australia probably has one of the easiest, huh, easiest, the easiest what? Because I think Australia has yeah, probably sorry, the I, easiest. Yeah, sorry, that's a really general question. Yeah, um, it has the easiest market, I think, because yeah. every school and every teacher has actually quite a significant amount of professional learning a budget, but also expectations of, of excellence. You know, they, they expect it to be good. And so there, there's actually a market that's well developed with really good people in it. And so it's got a healthy, there's a healthy competition, healthy collaboration as well. Going online actually has made collaboration with people who you might have considered your competitors so much easier because you can, you can just mount stuff so much quicker, quicker and the cost of doing so is minimal. Whereas before you were talking about serious investment of actual money to collaborate on anything of, of, over such a distance. So I really enjoyed that. But um, I'd, I'd say that in terms, so in terms of market, yeah, in terms of um, actually making a difference, it's probably in the public sector here in Scotland, we're beginning to. It took me 
10 years, 10 years to get a contract in my own country. So for a decade, we had so much, I mean, we had small contracts here and there, but nothing significant. And this year we shipped two really important uh, papers based on some co-design and collaborative workshops we'd done with amazing educators across Scotland. And the papers were submitted to the OECD on behalf of the Scottish Government about the two big parts of our curriculum and why they were not maybe performing as well as they could have done and what needed to be done differently. And of course, every system has that argument, but there's always great people doing great work and we were able to tap into their expertise. So we learned so much in our team because we were, we were le- tapping into the expertise of all these experts. The experts themselves felt that they learned a ton from working with each other, but also from the also from the input and provocations we were able to provide. And at the end of the day, the system benefits because we've got two very short, powerful papers that give very clear recommendations about what each person in the system needs to do to move things forward in a very pragmatic way. So that felt you know, not not the biggest piece of business we've ever done, but certainly it has the potential to create a big impact. And in international schools, I think we've transformed the way international schools think about strategy. The schools today who would do the old five-year plan kind of thing, they, they're not our customers yet, uh, but we've taken the world's top international schools and very few of them now have that kind of dawdling five-year plan and they're moving much more towards the agile approach to getting things done that um, software firms like yours would use um, and strategy which you can write on the back of a postcard rather than needing to um, have a, a shelf to put it on. Do you find it hard to convince them that oh, you know such an agile approach to education is effective? Are they stuck in the past and kind of don't want to move forward or what's it like? Well, that kind of intellectual snobbery that I mentioned earlier on, I think the, the loudest I ever heard it was when we were looking at changing, it was a school asked us to help them change the way they taught so that it was more design thinking for learning. And of course, the, the, just because a school decides, that means some board members and the leadership team decided. It does not mean that the 170 faculty agree with them. And so that's a really, it's a tough situation when you're faced with that number of people to then not just educate if you like and inform about how to go about it but also to convince and cajole and bring on board and you can always guarantee you're going to have 30 percent who are very quickly gung-ho and let's do this 30 percent who aren't so sure and wait to see who jumps first and then 30 percent who will make it their mission to drag down with strategy there's less convincing because we're working with school boards Uh, school boards are full of really smart people who work in the kind of industries where they, they woke up to that a few years ago. And now the conversations are actually, they're more about how feasibility, um, how can we afford it? But it's more about uh, that than why you would do it. Because everyone's recognising that if you had a plan beautifully polished and finished in January this year, then it was pretty much redundant. And where we've worked with schools on plans, uh, you know, we, we deliver, we've, we're still delivering planning work with clients at the moment. But because they've got a plan, it actually gives them certainty and focus that they wouldn't have had had they not had it, or if they had had a a kind of fixed five-year plan. So we've been able to put projects on ice, pause them until people feel they've got the mental bandwidth to cope with them. We've been able to amplify and accelerate other projects. And how do we do that? Because it's all laid out in little six-week blocks, and that makes it feasible, manageable. It makes it less awesome feeling. Mm. So that's my question. You said six week blocks. So that's the that's the length of your short term plan, right? That's it's also half a school term, which works okay. quite well because then you can you get literally a breather. Uh, you you get forced out of the building and uh, forced into uh, you know going home and having a break. So no school leader at the moment is having any breaks, but just that six week rhythm allows you to have six weeks. You actually have probably two weeks in school in fallow and that's often where the magic happens because the reflection is in those two weeks of conversations informal coffees it's rest space to think so we don't go from one sprint and then fall straight into the other we have maybe six seven weeks of activity a couple of weeks of celebrating and and listening probably then a long weekend or a midterm break or something like that to refresh and then you're back into it and it sounds slow by software company terms, but in schools, if you think that the normal unit of change is nine months, followed by a two-month pause, that's not, you know, it, it's almost like giving your, your team social jet lag. 
you're making them work super hard for nine months, exhausting them and then giving them two months to recuperate. Whereas instead, we're trying to create a more mindful approach where people are doing little and often. The final point I would make is that the the traditional, I think it was the traditional unit of nine months is is a daft unit to use for change. There's no reason why change should take nine months just because a school year takes nine months. And so you're introducing this, we call it, there's a concept of social jet lag and you actually get it if, you, if you're if you up early every morning for work during the week, but then at the weekend you're going out till three in the morning and you'll find that you take to Wednesday to recover and then you go and do it all over again. And in school, that's sometimes the way it feels. You kind of exhaust, ring these people out for nine months, give them a chance to recover. And then just as they're recovering, you hit them again. And what we're trying to introduce is a more manageable, more sane, more human well-being focused way of going about change which is little and often and make make sure that there's fallow built in people don't, shouldn't feel guilty about not working on big projects either because everyone's got day jobs everyone's got maintenance to do as well hmm. it's interesting that you mention you keep, you keep saying people but are you referring to students or teachers the whole lot and parents because when we do our strategy work it's collaborative strategy so we don't sit in a boardroom with 12 people and work it out we actually go out to the community and um, if you can imagine a a school with 1300 kids that's going to be about three thousand three and a half thousand interested people that between students and parents alone add the staff on so we we have a an approach which is designed to really go and listen as much as possible to them it's not surveys. I'm not. We of course there are surveys that you put out to try and you know pepper spray everyone and get get that view back. But that's not the data is as good as the questions you're asking. And really, when you're doing this, sat opposite someone with a coffee and having a chat, you can dive deeper and you can sometimes tap into a little bit of magic that a survey misses. So what we do is we yes we use surveys, but to fill in the gaps, we want to interview a lot of people. So we get a design team together of about 20, 25 people. And those people are students from about grade seven up. They're pupils from sometimes younger, you know, and it depends very much on the school and and the kids, of course, doing the work. Uh, Parents, the parents who are super keen and show up to everything, but we also try to get a couple of the parents who never show up to anything because they represent parts of the community. And it's not just, we we kick them off with a training session to learn how to ask great questions. And one of the parts is they interview each other. So from day one, we get this rich seam of data from 25 interviews. But then we go and ask each of them to interview 10 people. So all of a sudden, you've got the best part of 200 and 75 uh, in-depth insights from across the community. And we're asking them to tap into their niche of the community. So people like them. But on top of that, we have evenings uh, where we have maybe local business panels. You know, what do businesses need from schools? What kind of graduate are they seeking uh, from universities? Do they want kids straight out of school or do they want kids to go and do other things beforehand? What about coming to university later in your 20s, but go and do an apprenticeship beforehand? Lots of, you know, talking about the big issues of education, alternative pathways and not not being one right way to do things, but we bring it right down to the, the school level and, and ask in this school, in this community, what do you want? And we've done this in Western Australia in December last year, November, December, we did a tour all the way from the north of the state right the way down to the southwest and over to Kalgoorlie and we asked these questions in the similar kind of way to inform the education department's technology strategy so we we said we're we're not going to let you sit in Perth working out what someone in Pilbara is going to benefit from let's go and find out and so we had the most amazing uh, you know that rusty red dust everywhere tour to try and understand what people of Western Australia want and, and we untapped some magic there that we would have missed if we had just sent a survey out to people. Did you find there were common issues between the levels of schools, a primary school, secondary school, vocational, universities? Were the rooms for improvement the same across the board? It's just really interesting because when they're in the room together, you can't really tell who's who in, in the best possible way. So the fact is that a lot of the challenges, and and this isn't just true in Western Australia. Last week, I hosted a, a two-day summit with the probably 10 of the top university admissions deans. So Yale, Cornell, universities in, in Durham in England, in Singapore. So 
we had the University of Melbourne represented too with their associate dean for, for admissions. So we had a lovely selection of them and we had 10 of the directors from some of the top international schools. So of course, their students are striving to get into those universities and colleges. What did we discover there? We discovered the discovered the same thing that you see when you get vet school people next to elementary school teachers or primary school teachers. Everyone thinks that the other group are are trying to achieve something with the system and they're assuming for example that universities just want the cream of the crop piped in aged 18 so they can pipe them out aged 22 into employment and universities are sat there going we're fed up getting these academic drones who don't know how to solve a problem and then you've got vet schools doing really innovative work feeling that no one cares about them when actually the universities are saying we would like vet school graduates to come to university one day because actually they've got both they've got the knowledge but they've got the ability to apply that knowledge in ingenious ways and so universities are able to to solve so many of their problems when they've got people who can both do research but apply it as well as getting a degree so you and then you you what's that going to do with elementary school teachers Elementary school teachers sometimes feel that they're just preparing kids for middle school. Middle school just preparing kids for the hell that's high school and high school's just there to prepare them for the hell that awaits them in life. And that's not the way it is. It's, it should be a much more rich, diverse pathway that kids are taking through their learning. And we should be opening doors when they're 13 and 14 years old, not telling them that their choices are closing doors down. Well, it's, it's kind of limiting when you're in high school and 13 and 14, right? And you, your pathways, because we, we actually spoke to someone, Saxon Phipps, recently. He, he runs Year 13. I'm not sure if you're familiar. His purpose is to provide students with a purpose. A lot of, a lot of graduates are aimless, and I feel we're talking about how, you know, at a young age, middle school, I guess, there's not enough... They're not aware of what's possible. And they, like you said, they feel like the system is trying to get them to limit their choices mm. rather than in- increase Expand their them. opportunities. Yeah. 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 And I think that's, again, that's probably an, an attitude that made sense 20 years ago. I'm, I'm really struggling even to justify it 20 years ago. But maybe um, when you took I, a job and you sat in that job for your entire life, maybe that's exactly, when yeah. it made sense. I've, I've also sat in enough conference rooms for the last 20 years hearing people say that that's not true. I know it's not true because I was just undecided. I don't know if you guys knew what you wanted to do when you were 12. My don't. brother, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why you work for a tech company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, you know, my brother was lucky he was in the last year of primary school um, aged what 10 11 and they went on a, a school trip to the local newspaper and the smell of ink and seeing compositors and seeing journalists do their stuff even though it was a terrible local rag he was bitten and so he's, he's now you know happily in a world of journalism um, and has been for what 27 years um i i don't know i wanted to be and the, the, the pressure of what mum and dad think, the pressure of what your teachers pressure you into doing or not doing and what your mates are doing, all of that combines to just make it, I think, super confusing. And then you add in hormones and then you add in the fact that you're, you know, the one thing you need is prefrontal cortex to be able to make good decisions. And the research in the last four or five years shows that your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed till you're in your late 20s, early 30s even. So that probably explains why I started Notosh when I was 30 um, or 31 because I had the wherewithal to cope with all the competing in- inputs to work out that's what I'm going to do and pull it together. And I, I would say that I'm still learning. I'm sure most adults are still, you know, toying. I, midlife crises have always existed. Maybe midlife crises is just people, you know, 10 years previously, that they finally get the idea that, gosh, I don't want to do this. And it takes them 10 years to pluck up the courage uh, to maybe get into or out of the debt they're in or into more debt to retrain and then they jump for it and uh, maybe have the realization that you only get one go at this and you might as well do things that you love doing so i think it's really important for young people to not think that university just happens when you're 18 i think that the and that university is it i think you can learn so much if you are lucky enough to find the right company company with a small c or company with a big c if you fall in with the right people then you can often take much better choices slower choices as well so to all those you know i I know that i'm seeing pictures on my twitter stream of of graduates getting ready to leave australian high schools and i think the concept of a year 13 is great year 12 is not the end of learning but first year of university is not the start of it either and anyone who's been through that rigmarole knows that's not true so i would especially this year i think i think western australia has escaped so far a proper crisis. Yeah, been very um, lucky here. 
Mm. You've been very lucky, or have you? I, I think that there's nothing like a great crisis to actually stimulate the kind of innovation I've seen elsewhere. And when I see the, the you know, the, we've, we're launching an online business that I wanted to launch four or five years ago, but no client ever said they wanted to buy. And I've been forced into a deep learning curve in order to save and sustain and hopefully have a thriving business in the future. Because the thing that I needed to do to earn uh, the kind of uh, revenue that we've been used to earning for the last 10 years comes from destroying the planet on airplanes and from dodgy hotel breakfasts and terrible coffee and clients' institutions that isn't going to happen and i've actually said to my team i do not envisage traveling for work ever again i, I don't envisage traveling ever again and it, not for work and i think that when i come to perth next time it will be to catch up and be you know see friends and 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 catch up with 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 business catch up with business but not to to do it and i think that it would be an interesting experiment for people in Western Australia, particularly South Australia as well, where I've got a, a colleague based and, you know, crisis, what crisis? I think it'd be really interesting as an exercise to ask yourself, what if we'd been in the position that, that Spain, uh, France, Italy, UK had been in? What innovation would we have attempted to save our business? How would we have been affected? Go through the scenario and then see what magic emerges. Because sometimes, you know, you, there, there is a danger that, that WA, uh, New Zealand as well, well, the right decisions were taken to save lives when you emerge from this are you going to be in as, as competitive a position as the companies that are left and there's a lot shutting down but is there are you going to be in as competitive a situation as the companies that were left and worked out new more agile cheaper ways to work together before we continue this podcast here's a message from our sponsor we believe that you can create art and beauty with technology we think big we move quietly we are Ninja Software. Rolling back a bit to the to the work that you do in education, you talk a lot about the the processes, the, the education, the improving strategically you know, how a school approaches education. But how do you know you've actually succeeded in what you want to do? How do you know that you know what you've taught has has come through and what you've implemented, what they've implemented has worked? What, how do you measure that? The times very early on where we weren't very good at measuring impact, uh, we would sometimes find out years later. So you'd be at an event, a conference, and someone would come up and say, I saw you six years ago. And uh, we did this, and it's just transformed our school. And you're sat there going, I would have been quite nice to know, not six years late. But, uh, you know, that, that's a long lead time. So one of the things is just working out beforehand what getting people, the people you're working with to articulate what it is they're trying to achieve. We can't provide a standard kind of question checklist of here's what we're going to bring you. And that is different, I think, from, it's different from a lot of products and services where you know, you know if you do this, then this will happen. Education is not an if this, then that. It doesn't quite work that way. So we co-design the objectives and key results that, that people are hoping to achieve so what, what are the goals? One or two goals, not much more than that. And then what key results would they expect to see in the journey? And the nice thing about a key result is it's it's not specific to the point that it specifies a bunch of tasks that will be done because those tasks might not be right in the heat of the moment. But what it does do is it provides specificity of outcome. So we expect to, to see this kind of reaction. So in some schools, they just want students to show up on time or not leave. <laughs> in other schools, it can be about the student being able to give feedback on their work or on the work of a peer. That's quite measurable stuff. And so you need to work it out with them and you need to be very clear on what it is they're looking for. And then we'll tweak and adapt what we're doing to make sure that it absolutely delivers on that and then you just do the you just do a test again uh, four months later six months a year later have we achieved what we had hoped we would faster than maybe than we'd hoped we would so we've had massive impact and we know it because of those kinds of uh, pre-metrics that we work out on that topic of you know different schools needing different things i want to touch on the fact that you mentioned that you were in hong kong a while back and my background is vietnamese it is it is an asian country and the, the education system is a bit different in a lot of Asian countries. It's, it's not about recharging at all. It's all about, you know, heavy-duty rote learning. Yeah, yeah brutal, uh, you know, brutal competition. Uh, have, have you done any work in Asia? And, and have you managed to transform any of these schools? In well, the work that well. we've done in Asia yeah. has always been with international schools, which are very different, obviously, from the state system. However, 
a lot of the students attending those schools are they they are nationals of the of the country that we're in, even if they're passporting from the US or the UK or or Canada or whatever. So the culture obviously comes in, and so yeah, I've seen the the Asian kind of. I've had a board member introduce herself as I'm an Asian tiger mum, um, <laughs> proud of it too, yeah. and proud of it. Yeah. And she was going to tell me how education should be, and she did. I think that. <laughs> uh, when we've done that work you asked earlier on about convincing people is it hard to convince people you don't try because that's a culturally ingrained thing but what you can do is is and you do yes ands and so the rote learning rote learning is one thing but the direct teaching that is often associated with rote learning is not always bad and you've all had I mean, we've all had great amazing lecturers or masterclass leaders who we've just loved and it's not that they even talk that long but if they give a 10 minute lecture you make sure you're there in time because you know it's going to be fantastic you look at masterclass.com is just lectures it's beautifully shot it <laughs> pulls together lectures I like that even though I'm a constructivist and I love hands on learning sometimes I just like to be lazy lean back in this chair and watch a masterclass and, and learn something from it that way now that we know that I'm going to learn less because I don't go away and then do the rote learning on the back of it that you're talking about. So what do we do? You, you, you add to what's that there already. And so you make sure that the experience in school is a rich one that has that tapestry of activity, collaboration, cooperation, that it has some great direct teaching. Direct instruction is not about a teacher talking all the time. It's about the direct interactive instruction where you have interaction between students, between the teacher, and it's alive. Um, and you add on to that collaborative projects, you add on to that cooperative learning strategies where kids are giving feedback to each other and levelling up with each other. That that's that, That's really key. So can you change a culture? No. But can you create a school where the parent understands what's going on in the classroom, the kid knows what's expected of them, and the teachers are skilled enough to run that kind of interactive environment yes you can and i've never had a challenge with that even in the most didactic old-fashioned top-down teacher talk schools we've still managed to create a dent at least in that practice speaking of old-fashioned a lot of you know i guess a lot of schools today operate with the same mentality that you know you have the same job for the rest of your life and Mm. you go in you know you go into university and you study that so Apparently, you know, these days people change jobs a lot more often, seven times in one's career. I'd just like to know, uh, what, what are your thoughts about how do you prepare students for such, you know, such chaos in their career? Or what is the trick there to, to prepare them for that? It's a great question. When I think about the summit that we had last week, the first thing I'd say is a lot of schools don't believe that. A lot of schools are, and a lot of teachers in those schools do believe and do understand that kids' uh, career trajectories are going to be super varied and far more varied than than theirs were. There's some other evidence as well that came together from this thought paper um, that we've been producing for the Council of International Schools, and it's a it's all about that question. It's all about how you how you we plan better for the varied career paths of young people. There are a couple of big questions that schools but not just schools it also businesses like yours small medium and large corporations need to think about so one is success whatever success is is really connected to well-being first and foremost so if you're not right in your skin and achieving well at school i bet you knew kids like that at school as well maybe you were one of those kids at school life's not great you know you can be getting straight A's you can be excelling in academics but if if you're not right in your skin it means nothing and long term you're you things don't quite turn out the way they should have done for you and I've seen that firsthand but we also see it in the in the research the second thing is that your transitions are really individual they are not linear and they're not really timetableable and the biggest challenge in schools is actually their timetable and uh, the crisis here in Scotland has meant that students are working on longer stretches of time, maybe three hour blocks rather than 45 minutes here or there. It's to reduce the movement around school and to reduce the chance that they're kind of uh, uh, mixing with other bubbles or other year groups. Yeah, I agree. Can you talk to us a bit about the work you did with BHP in Western Australia, the the STEM challenge, Future Ready? Yeah. So yeah. this is the lovely thing of being in a team is that I am in no way, shape or form responsible for this amazing piece of work. Um, the STEM challenge is a funny one because it, it, came out, it came as one of these last minute things. 
it was it was with Seven West Media who were media partners on a conference that I was keynoting. It was one of those things where they spotted, oh, he's keynoting, any chance we can partner up? And we said, sure, what on? And said, we don't know. So we, came, <laughs> so we came up with an idea because it was STEM, 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 and in Western Australia, there's mining. It was a pretty easy leap and a hop to work out what a challenge could be on. The feedback we had from teachers who participated in it was just phenomenal. And I was lucky enough in, in February to meet some of the, in, in February and actually early in November, I was in Perth again. And, and I was lucky enough to meet some of the educators and their students who had participated in it. Uh, it was brilliant. It was just fantastic. All right. So we always end our interviews with one whimsical question. Uh, it's, it's always the same one. So I don't know how familiar you are with wrestling or MMA, but when the fighters come out, they, they have their intro music. And so the lights, lights go down and the, the music starts and they come out. And so you're a keynote speaker, so imagine, yeah, I, I'm the keynote organizer and I say, you know, Ewan, what, what song would you like us to play for your walk out onto the stage? No sound, no sound engineer ever asks me. They always just <laughs> choose uh, the Proclaimers, uh, I Would Walk 500 Miles, which oh, I now oh. hate. I used to like it as a song <laughs> and I can't stand it. Isn't there was song? a tune... It's kind well. of racist, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Yeah, vaguely. I think that there was a song that I loved. I can't even remember what it's called now. And I, years ago, I had jokes with Peter Ford, who was an old friend, old colleague, about... He's, he's also one of the best um, poets, slam poets and public speakers that I've ever seen. So I saw him for the first time, I, I think it's 16 years ago that I saw him doing some slam poetry at an event that I was at and another seven years before I was able to hire him. But um, I made a joke, I said, you know, you're so good, you need to have your own theme music, your own walk-on music. And there was a piece and it was the scene from that film with Catherine Zeta-Jones, where she has to do like a ballet, a ninja ballet through lasers. It stars Sean Connery as well. You know the one I mean? Entrapment? Uh, Entrapment. No, no, no. Entrapment. Entrapment. Yeah, yeah. Entrapment with Michael Douglas and Sean Connery. Yes. Exactly. So that that f- terrible film, but it has this great soundtrack moment when she's going through the lasers. And I can't remember the name of it, but that was my chosen piece of music 16 years ago. So I'm going to go for that. It's hugely funky. I'll let you find it and then you can put um, five seconds of it so you don't get done for copyright. But yeah. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, cool. for sure. <laughs> Open the All right, so we'll see you then. Right. Have a great Catch weekend. You later. Thanks so much, Ewan. Saw the white rider take and take some more. You've made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. Today is Remembrance Day. And for that reason, I dedicate this episode to my great-grandfather, who fought in the First World War and is one of the only Australian veterans awarded the Knight of the Legion of Honour, a class of the highest French order by the French government. Edmund Charles Spencer, or Ted, as his family knew him, died peacefully in January 1999 at a ripe old age of 102. And on this day in tech history, in 2006, the PS3 went on sale with a built-in Blu-ray player and hard drive. Sony's PlayStation 3 was a crucial factor in the Blu-ray's victory over HD DVD, and we are now two generations away from the PS3, with the PS5 going on sale two days ago. Thanks for listening to today's episode. That's it from John and I. We hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure you head on over to the website and sign up to the newsletter. And don't forget to lock up when you leave.